Welcome everybody to the AMS Performance YouTube channel. In today's episode, we're gonna learn about air-to-air -air intercoolers and air-to-water intercoolers. We're gonna learn a lot of science about how both systems work today, so let's go ahead and get started. Make sure to let you guys know that this is not saying that air to air or air to water is better than the other this is mainly a video to show you guys how oems and aftermarkets like ourselves use each of the two different types to their advantage just want to make that clear before we get started now let's go head over to the other building we're going to talk with martin and he's going to explain everything you need to know about how these systems work all right hi i'm martin from ams performance and today we're going to do a little tech talk about intercoolers and more specifically air to water but first understand air to water i think you have to understand intercoolers in a generality so we're gonna talk about air to air first i've got a generic uh, rectangle here with representing air to air intercooler core this is the charge side so we have hot air coming in here on this side here and our cooler air coming out on this side and then i'll draw green for the ambient cooling air uh, which is going through the core Typically, you know, you put the air intercooler in front of your car. The air is coming into the front. Obviously, when a car is not moving, there's no air flowing through. It needs to pick up speed. More air goes to the core. You have hot air coming here on the right from your turbocharger. Ideally, that hot air being transferred from the charger to the heat exchanger, the intercooler core, and then the ambient air flowing through it pulls that heat away and out the back of the intercooler. So again, that, that's the concept and theory of it. Why are the intercoolers different sizes, different lengths, heights? This is a cross section of the, we call it the charge side, where the hot air from the turbo comes in and cool air comes out. That's kind of a side view here. For example, this small box you see right here, that might be for a car making 300 horsepower, whereas the more mass flow you have, the bigger you make your intercooler on the charge side. So again, this being here, the ambient air flowing through the intercooler and then out the backside. But the thicker you go, the harder it is for the air to go uh, through the intercooler. Unless this is like a Bonneville car or you know, you're going over 100 miles an hour, you don't have the, the best airflow through that. And that's why typically OEMs keep the intercoolers pretty thin. You'll see the same concept, a radiator. Radiators are, have a large frontal area, um, but they're usually pretty thin. That's for to let the airflow go through the radiator easily. Now you'll see probably different lengths of intercoolers. So we'll say the temperature, and this is the hot side here, is 300 degree Fahrenheit, let's say 20 PSI, and uh, we're making 300 horsepower. On the cool side, this air might be cooled down to 120 degree air. And your pressure on this side probably won't be 20 PSI. It might only be 19 PSI. For the heat transfer from the air to the intercooler has to go through these tiny little passages and those have fins in it now the design of the fins the density the type of fin the row height that all determines how much heat gets pulled away from the air and into the intercooler and that's basically a restriction that air is hitting that flowing through that there's even some fin designs which really cause the air to be turbulent and slow the air down and causes a pressure drop so you lost one pound of boost but the good news is you lost you know quite a bit of uh, temperature 180 degrees you know it's gonna be safer for your engine less detonation prone now let's say this cooling air that's hitting the front of this intercooler is 75 degrees why not lower this temperature 120 is good 75 is going to be better right problem is to get to that you're gonna to have to make this thing super long. So now you might get this air down to maybe 80 degrees, maybe within five degrees of ambient, right? Well, the problem is now you might only have 17 PSI. So you just lost three PSI across this core from the restriction of the air going through this core. Hey, you drop a temperature from 120 to 80, but again, it's a trade-off. Uh, law of diminishing returns. That 40 degree temperature drop 
it's probably not gonna make up a difference of losing another two PSI of boost. Again, there's this kind of an optimal level, and again, depends on application. That's why it's really not one intercooler fits all. Um, again, that's why we upgrade the factory intercoolers. They're designed for a certain power level, certain boost level, certain temperature. You transfer across the intercooler, and as we make more power, you usually have to go up with the intercoolers. Um, and the thing with air to air, we're typically limited by space, uh, you know, frontal area of the car, of how big we can get the core. And it's, you know, how tall can you make the core? How wide can you make it? you know, or thick. And that's why a lot of OEMs are moving to an air to water setup because there's a benefit to it. You can make it a lot smaller and I'll go into that a little bit more detail. Uh, on the flip side here, you can make this thing shorter and maybe not lose any boost. Maybe you have 20 PSI coming out on the other side, but now your temperature over here might be 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, that one PSI you've gained from 19 to 20 for making this shorter, you gain a lot of temperature. So again, it might be not worth the, uh, the trade-off. Another thing to consider is, like I mentioned, the charge side, the cross-section area, this right here, of this charge side. The more power you make, which equates to mass airflow, the larger you have to make this charge side. You might see intercoolers have this kind of design. I've seen this before. Hot air coming in, cool air coming out. So what you notice here, you know, the cross section area is pretty massive, um, but the flow length, this flow length is pretty short. So what these are typically used for, if you have a pretty big displacement engine that runs low pressure, you know, 700 wheel horsepower V8, eight PSI. Typically the correlation is the more boost you run, the hotter the charge temperature is um, because the turbo is compressing there, putting work into the air. So an eight PSI, boost level you might only have uh, 180 degree temperature air you're reducing the flow length because you don't need as much temperature drop you might achieve your 120 degrees out of here with this short flow length but you had need a really large cross-section area because you're flowing a lot of air so again your pressure might be eight psi here maybe you know seven and a half psi you're barely losing anything whereas if you tried to force this power level through this intercooler up here, you may have a big pressure drop across this intercooler. You may have to run a lot more boost to achieve the same results on an intercooler. Um, so that's kind of some different applications. The big reason air to water intercoolers physically can be much smaller is that water has a you know thermal conductivity of 20 times that of air. You know, you put uh, I don't know a piece of metal into the oven and you pull it out, you know, and let it sit on a countertop, it's gonna be hot for a long time. It takes a long time for that, for the air to basically cool it down. Whereas if you dunk it in water, it cools it down really quick. And that's that's the reason why, because it's 20 times greater the thermal um, heat conductivity of air. So you can make the intercooler a lot smaller. So here we, are, here we have an air to air intercooler and an air to water intercooler. And these are just arbitrary. Um, they're not equivalent of each other. I'm not gonna say this is supports the same horsepower as this one or same mass airflow. But my guess is probably wouldn't be too far off from each other. See, this is a Garrett core, which is a really good core. Garrett has a really good fin design, fin density. They got pretty much everything optimized, engineered correctly, uh, and it works really well. A long time ago, we did testing against other manufacturers, intercooler cores, and size for size, gear beat them all and then some by a long shot you know you look at the fin design here it's done like that for a reason i won't quote exact numbers but you know we're talking maybe 50 degree temperature or more in some cases we're gonna have maybe 100 degree air coming out of the cold side on the garrett and 150 or 175 uh, on the uh, other intercooler so it makes a makes a big difference so uh, some people ask like oh it's the same size core it's just and it's cheaper it, that doesn't mean anything it's totally made up pure fiction it's what's inside that counts because this is more important than the physical size of the core. The thing with the air to water, you can get much, much denser fin density for the charge side. And you can also uh, stack the rows closer together. And that's again, because the water, the water pulls the heat away much quicker. This length here, for example, the air comes in on this side, it goes out this side. It doesn't have a large length to go through. Whereas this one has all this to travel through, but it's because it has to, right? Because the air is not pulling as much heat out. In this case, when water's running through this thing, from here to here, it could be massive different temperature because that water is pulling all that heat out of this aluminum core. And it could be actually more effective than the air to air. So it's kind of a, a you know balancing act. Full length shorter, you pack the fins in denser, make all this tighter. So you might have the same pressure drop, 
but a across a much shorter flow length to make them much more compact. At a stop sign or when a car is moving very slowly, you have none or very little air moving through the intercooler. So this thing's just sitting there heat soaking. It's not getting cooled down. This thing has to be at speed for air to go through it. This, on the other hand, has a pump, water pump, that's constantly flowing, pumping water or a coolant mixture through it, cooling this thing down. You can make the water passages much tighter, much smaller. In a racing application, especially drag racing or half mile row racing, you can have a ice tank. You know, typically in an OEM application with the air to water, you have a water circuit, right? So that's the kind of downside, a lot more complexity. You have the air to water intercooler, plumbing, hoses, wiring for the pump. You have a water pump to pump through here. Now you have a heat exchanger because you got to cool that water down, right? If you just sat in a tank with no heat exchanger, that water would just pick up the heat from intercooler and just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter. The good news is because water has a lot of thermal mass, it's pretty stable. It doesn't fluctuate a ton. Um, and the more capacity you have in the system, the more stable it's gonna be. It's take longer to heat up and longer to cool down. In a real world scenario, you can see that we have this graph here. This graph is actually from Dave Rose Schneider's car, Wally, his R35 GTR, making about 2,300 horsepower, roughly. And as you can see, we have two different lines here. The green line is when the car was air to air, and the purple pinkish line is when the car was switched over from air to air to air to water. This is on similar power settings with very similar boost. During the actual quarter mile run, the car was almost 60 degrees cooler on the charge air temp so that there is a very good example on why air to water is beneficial. So that's some of the things we take into consideration we're redesigning products, some accessories, we'll put bigger heat exchangers to get rid of the heat and more capacity to make it more stable. The advantage of if you put a ice box, a reservoir for example, you can again put ice in there, you can be circulating 40 degree water through here. So you might get a charge temp out of this intercooler, that's actually colder than the ambient air outside. It's a 100 degree day outside at the drag strip. You're pumping 40 degree water. You can have a race car making a ton of boost and getting, you know, 60 degree charge air coming out of this thing, which is, which is fantastic. But if you're uh, Las Vegas, St. Louis in the middle of July, and it's 100 degrees out, you know, 105 degrees out and super, you know, humid out, you don't want to be using that air to cool down your uh, charge air. So again, running an ice tank with ice is a pretty huge benefit. To get, you know, for example, 25% more effectiveness out of an air to air intercooler, you have to grow this thing in some dimension, right? So 25% delta on this is quite a bit bigger than a 25% delta on this. You know, here's uh, Infinity intercooler for the Q50, Q60. Um, and again, the OEM makes things a certain way. They have a performance goal in mind, but also cost is a huge factor. So either stampings or some of the provisions with your end tanks limit the size they can make it. So we take advantage of that. Yeah, these end tanks are actually crimped on, so they need a certain size header for this, and that kind of eats up some core size. Well, we're not doing that. We're making our own end tanks, which are welded on. We get we have this height advantage already right away. Plus, we've grown this thing by quite a bit. The fin density, fin type, style, row height, all that is, I'd say, more important even than the physical size of it. And what a lot of the OEMs are doing now is actually a really, really impressive job on their intercoolers. We've done a lot of testing and it's easy to make an aftermarket product perform worse than the stock one, even though we can make it bigger. We've tested it and seen worse results in stock. So we spent a lot of time finding uh, suppliers, you know, whatever we had to do to meet those demands and, you know, verify the product. We have a lot of testing in this. We've got well over a hundred runs on the dyno. We're measuring, you know, water temperature in and out of this intercooler, air temperature across, boost pressure, pressure drop. So, a lot goes into it than just, you know, oh, let's make it bigger and then slap it together. It's a lot, a lot more goes into it than that. So one interesting thing, this is the Supra uh, intake manifold. And what you see, it's integrated. It's the intercooler and intake manifold in one design. So on the Q50, Q60, Infinity put the intercoolers. It's between uh, right before the throttle body. It's just attached to the throttle body. It's not part of the manifold, but it's all tightly packaged. Where in this case, the BMW, Oh, slash the Supra. What did he say? <laughs> they integrated the intercooler into the intake manifold. So again, it saves a ton of space from putting intercooler out front. You know, this is kind of a unique challenge. Again, making it better than stock. Getting okay, prototypes made, testing it, making changes, revisions, iterations until we see a good enough performance delta to call it an AMS product. That about sums it up for air to water uh, and air to air intercoolers. Hopefully you learned some things, answered the questions. Well, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.